Well, hello. This is Faith Nation Wednesday, and happy Valentine's Day. Hi, everyone. I'm Jenna Browder. And I am David Brody. Hi, folks. Thanks for joining us. Hey, make sure it's Valentine's Day, so make sure you show us some love down there at the bottom. There it is. Share, it says, Share Faith Nation on Facebook. That's what we, That's Valentine's Day love for us. Mm -hmm. We're looking forward to a big show. <laughs> we are a big show ahead, so we have asked uh, John Jessup to join us. John, good to have you. Mm -hmm. Jenna, it's great to be here on such a busy, busy day. Um, Tony Suarez of the National Hispanic Christian Leadership Conference and Dr. Ronnie Floyd, President of the National Day of Prayer, will be here to discuss how the church should respond to immigration reform. And our very own David Brody has a brand new book, The Faith of Donald J. Trump, that's just out. He'll switch gears uh, a little bit and go from interviewer to interviewee a little later when Jenna and I talk about his book. And finally, Jenna sits down with Fox & Friends host Ainsley, Ainsley Earhart. That was hard for me to say. So make sure you stay tuned and share the show with your friends. All right, John, thank you. Good to see you, sir. Great to be here, You're my friend. You're looking dapper, as always. I'm trying. i got to keep up with you guys. I like the tie. It's uh, it's very festive it, for it today. Is, it is impressive. <laughs> but it's subtle. <laughs> it's nice. Thank you. Uh, festive tie. Okay, unfortunately, we buried the lead, which is my book, but we'll do something else. Uh, first today, the Senate working to fix the immigration system. That's right. Debate began this week to find a way to solve this whole problem. Our Capitol Hill correspondent, Abigail Robertson, joins us live from the Hill. Hi, Abigail. Uh, tell us, you know, where do negotiations stand? Well, as of two hours ago, the Senate is officially underway with immigration debates, and there are multiple bills being considered this week, but two main ones I would look out for. One is the bipartisan McCain-Coons bill. Now, this bill protects the Dreamers and enhances border security, but it doesn't any, do anything else than that, and President Trump says he will not support it, and it doesn't really fund his border wall. Now, the other bill is a Secure and Succeed Act. This was introduced by Senator Trump. Chuck Grassley, and it was based on the immigration framework put out by the White House. It has strong support by the president and includes all the main things he would like to see in an immigration compromise, like protecting the Dreamers, giving $25 billion for the border wall, ending the visa lottery program, and ending what Republicans refer to as chain migration. Now, I spoke with Senator Republican Senator Bill Cassidy yesterday, and he said if Democrats are serious and really want to see a solution for protecting the Dreamers, this is the bill. This is a good solution in which everybody gets something they want. If Democrats want a solution, we have a solution. If all they want is an issue, that's cynical, but we won't get the solution. Now, as of now, it is unclear if any of these bills will get the 60 votes needed to clear the Senate. Abby, let me ask you about the timeline on all of this. Uh, what about that timeline for making something happen on immigration? Yeah, Majority Leader Mitch McConnell says he wants to see a final vote by the end of this week. He says the time is now and that they're, he says the time is now to fix this and that they've had months, if not years, to debate this. And he wants to see a final vote by the end of this week. Well, sticking along the theme of immigration, how should the church be responding to the immigration debate? And what's its role? We're joined by now by Tony Suarez and Dr. Ronnie Floyd to take a look at that topic. Tony, we'll start with you. Is there a biblical view of how we should be looking at the immigration reform debate? Absolutely, and thank you for having me on the program. From the book of Leviticus to the book of Matthew, the Bible admonishes us to care about how we treat the stranger, the foreigner, the neighbor that lives amongst us. So it's not just Old Testament uh, theology, it's also New Testament doctrine, that God cares about the way we care for others. And this is an ongoing thing, and we've been praying, the church has been praying for a long time, that our government, specifically Congress, would, uh, would finally solve after 30 years this, this complex yet vital issue, because it's important even to our Christian faith. Tony, how does someone reconcile a biblical worldview if they fall on the opposite side of immigration and they advocate for deporting people like the Dreamers? Well, I, I personally have an issue with that because the, when we're speaking specifically of Dreamers, we're not talking about people that willfully broke the law. You're talking about young people. You're talking about children that were brought here by their parents. They're at no fault. They were brought here, and I want to use this in a very broad context, but uh, they should not have to pay the price for the sins of their parents. And, I, and that's what I want to say very broadly. Uh, they, they, were, they were brought here. They're, they're 
actually innocent victims that were brought into the country, but now they're here, they eat our food, we, we, they go to school with us, they worship with us, and some have been here for now two decades, going on three decades. This is the only country that they truly have ever known. And to deport them to a country where they might not speak the language, they don't know the culture, not only do I feel that, uh, that it would be very difficult, I think it would almost be inhumane to send someone back into those conditions. Ronnie, I want to bring you into the conversation, go into those four walls of the church. Uh, has this been a divisive issue within your own church? Ronnie, can you hear me? All right. Well, Tony, let me ask you that. Can you hear me, Tony, on that? Yes, sir, I can hear you on that. What about uh, within the church? What are, you, what are you hearing? What stories are you hearing? Well, you know, there's overwhelming support within the church when it comes to immigration reform, when it comes to, when it comes to uh, compassion for dreamers, here's the issue we're having. The, the pulpit and the pews hear the message and believe the message. Mm -hmm. Translating it to seeing Congress reflect what we the people have asked them to do, that's where the issue comes in. And the, the, the fault lies squarely at the feet of Congress. We keep looking to the White House to solve this issue. And the White House cannot solve this issue. And I want, you know, taking a biblical verse just a little bit out of context, the book of Psalms says, I lift mine eyes to the hill from whence cometh my help. My hope right now, speaking from a political sense, is in Capitol Hill. They are the only people that can solve this issue. And we, the people, you're talking about over 70% of evangelicals have supported immigration reform, have supported helping dreamers. But we have yet to see Congress and Senate, and really the blame is at the, at the hands of the Senate right now. We, we have yet to see them translate that into uh, good legislation that would finally solve this issue. And we're talking about almost three decades of not solving this issue. Republican presidents and Democratic presidents have come and gone, yet there's a lot of the same players in the House and the Senate, yet they can never solve this issue, yet they continue to uh, pass the blame to the White House, and I think it's unfair. I, we, have, we have a wonderful administration right now that is willing to compromise and to bring a resolution to this issue. And if President Trump is able to sign some type of legislation on DREAMers, it will be the largest piece of immigration legislation that a president has signed since Ronald Reagan. Who would have thought that was possible uh, when we were campaigning for, these pres uh, for this administration uh, just you know, a year and a half ago? Tony, we had wanted to give both you and Dr. Ronnie Floyd an opportunity to weigh in on this, but uh, Dr. Floyd's link, um, I, I think we're having some problems with it. But if you can hear, if you both can hear me, we want you both to weigh in. This has been such a divisive issue. How do you encourage Christians to be praying about immigration? I can well, hear I, you I, now. I, and, uh, Go ahead, Dr. Dr. Floyd. I, we'll start uh, with you. Sure, thank you. I, uh, I can hear you now, and I could not hear anything before except what uh, your guest was talking about. But I would say in relationship to how we can pray about that, that should be the, the church's number one role right now is to pray for our leaders to be able to, uh, to do everything they can to come together. And uh, I think it's really imperative that this is the moment in American history when we need to come together on this. Everyone's going to have to give some. And I just hope and pray that, that we will take our place as the church, standing for family, standing for what the Bible teaches, standing for what is right in relationship to taking care of the refugee, and doing everything we can to stand for those who are, who are persecuted for their faith across the world. And all of these things somehow come into this whole element of being able to understand how to treat those who are going through a time of uniqueness in their life in relationship to not having a homeland. Pastor Floyd, let me, let me ask you real quick about the divisiveness in the church. That was my original question to you a few minutes ago. What have you seen within the four walls of the church? Well, obviously there is divisiveness on the, over, this, over this issue. This issue is a huge issue. And uh, obviously it is a divisive issue. But I, what I'm seeing happen, especially among the realm of the evangelical believers, is that I'm seeing a real movement of coming together to believe that, uh, that, that we've got to do everything we can to, to express 
conviction in relationship to protecting our country, which we cannot neglect protecting our country. That's the role of, of government, is to protect its citizens. And then the second thing is in the role of compassion. Uh, and all of the uh, families and children and the whole DACA issue, along with refugees, along with those who are walking through difficult times in relationship to their faith across the world. I mean, we have got to be the place that is compassionate and wants to do what we can to honor every human individual on this earth. But at the same time, preserve what we know to be right in our nation, and that is to protect our citizens in our nation. Thank you, Dr. Floyd. Um, Tony, I want you to weigh in. I want to give you the same opportunity to, to discuss how Christians or how you would encourage Christians to be praying about such a divisive issue. Well, I, I'm going to echo the words of my mentor, my boss, Reverend Sam Rodriguez, that reminds us and admonishes us that when it comes to these issues, these are, these are pro-life issues. We, when, we in the pro-life community, we care about life from the womb to the tomb, as Reverend Rodriguez would say. And silence is not an option. This is not a Republican or a Democratic issue. These are human lives made in the image of God. They worship with us. They go to school with our children. And I think, I think when, we, when we're able to humanize the issue, we're able to pray and come at it with the compassion of Christ, which I do believe that it, it is very necessary for this issue. This is beyond a political issue. These are human lives that are at stake, families that could possibly be torn apart and separated. And when we see it from that vantage point, we see it through the eyes of compassion. All right, Tony Suarez and Dr. Ronnie Floyd, thank you both so much for joining us today. Thank you. Well, as always, we have Amber Strong in the social seat taking all of your comments. Amber, what are people saying about this? People are definitely uh, weighing in, and this has been a hot topic on the CBN News Facebook page for the past week because everyone seems to have an opinion on this one way or the other. Uh, this one from Jan who said, I read the entire bill. It's excellent. And, and encouraging others to not just weigh in um, and, and react, but get online and read exactly the parameters of the bill. Mm -hmm. The next one is from Timothy. He says, if they... I assume he means the Dreamers or the uh, DACA recipients, uh, have been here for two years or for ten, two decades, they should have sought citizenship. Uh, and this is a question that we've seen over and over, like, why haven't they become citizens? And that's actually something I, I tackled. Uh, I talked to an immigration attorney last weekend, and I asked that very question from a journalistic standpoint. I said, what's the problem? Why mm -hmm. haven't they taken advantage of this? And uh, to sum it up, three things, he, he said, we have a complicated immigration system, we have a costly immigration system, and in, at the end of the day, it still puts them in the same position of having to go back to their home country, a country that most of them have no knowledge of. Right. Um, so we, we break down the nuances of it on CBNnews.com, but uh, it's definitely a, a complex situation, which is why Congress is trying to handle it in the first place. Yeah, it's such a sticky issue. Right. Yeah, Great for reporting, sure. Amber. Thank yeah. you. Well, coming up, the faith of Donald J. Trump. Our very own David Brody talks about his new book and the inside access he had to write it. Israel and the Middle East, center of the world for thousands of years and still creating headlines that reach back to the Bible, hosted by award-winning correspondent Chris Mitchell. Jerusalem Dateline brings a Christian perspective to events that literally change history, whether it's the front lines or underground. Jerusalem Dateline is your window to Israel, Jerusalem, and the Middle East. Contact us at the address on your screen. Well, yesterday was a pretty big day. Uh, it's your birthday. All right. Happy birthday. Thank you. Thank Belated you so much. birthday. Thank you. Uh, and it was also the release for your new book, The mm. Faith of Donald J. Trump. Yeah, I should probably read it uh, at some point. No, I did. Good. I, I've read it. Uh, I have read it. It's quite good. Really? Yeah, I'd highly okay. recommend it. Well, that makes one of us. <laughs> good. Well, this week uh, has been a busy one. I've been making the media rounds uh, up in New York to talk about the book that I co authored with Scott Lamb. Here with reaction, the author of the brand new book, The Faith of Donald J. Trump, a spiritual biography, David Brody. Chief political correspondent for the Christian Broadcasting Network, David Brody. David joins us now. David co-writes the new book. Here is the author of The Faith of Donald J. Trump, a spiritual biography, which is out today. David, thank you so much for being here. This is interesting, David, because you wrote a spiritual biography of Donald Trump. He's not going to make a deal with two-bit dictators that are threatening 
to destroy America. You'll see a lot of law and order. North Korea is a good example of that, but there's a compassionate side to him as well, and we've got stories in the book to tell about. It. Has Donald Trump once said publicly that he has sinned, fallen short of the glory of God, and yes. asked for God's yes. forgiveness? Yes, you can Google it. You took some clips from a couple years ago, then you just took a clip from recently yeah, the at the prayer National Prayer Breakfast. Breakfast. Right. And what happened in between? Mm. That's what the book's about. Oh. Oh, wow. This is riveting read. You weren't even watching. Oh, you were reading the book. I Thank, was you. Reading the Thank book. you very much. We're Good reading plug. the book. Good Thank plug. You. Thank you. David, so let's ask the question that's probably burning on most people's minds. Yes, it's a burning uh, question in America. What exactly do you mean when you talk about the faith of Donald Trump? I understand it's more about philosophy and worldview than actual faith. Well, that's right. And, 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 and second, mm -hmm. secondly, oh, it's a two-part question. You, it's a two-parter. Oh, you know Lord. me. I'm going to milk everything that it's worth. <laughs> um, how did you come up with the idea to write the book? Well, a couple different things. First of all, let's start with the idea to write the book. Uh, I have to tell you, during the campaign, uh, Scott Lamb, who I've known for a couple of years, uh, we had no desire to write this book during the campaign. We didn't know if he was going to win, obviously, but even that, uh, we didn't even think about it long term. But after the election, we said to ourselves, and this kind of gets into your first question, which is, you know what, he's going to be a sitting president of the United States. Mm. We better let people know about his worldview, uh, how faith has informed that. I mean, it's a, in essence, it's a, a help to U.S. history uh, to, sure. to really do a deep dive. And that's what Scott Lim, Lamb did so well, is to really do a deep dive on this uh, because he did a lot of that research about his, uh, Donald Trump's Lutheran roots and his Protestant roots from his mom's side, Lutheran on the father, uh, Protestant on the mom. And, and so we go back and, and we tell stories, and it's, it's a pretty interesting uh, read, if I do say so myself. David, now you've been making the rounds up in New York. You're here, you're there, yeah. CNN, you're with Hannity all over the place. Mm -hmm. uh, we just saw some clips of all of the interviews. Uh, what has been the reaction in the mainstream media to this book? Well, I, you know, it's been a bit all over the place. I mean, overall, pretty good. Uh, wh what I mean by that is that, you know, for example, S.E. Cup on Headline News, mm -hmm. uh, you know, that, that was pr pretty, pretty good. Uh, Fox and Friends and even Chris Cuomo uh, this morning in New York on New Day, all really treating me pretty, pretty well and uh, well in terms of respecting. You know, I think I have standing in the sense that I've interviewed him nine times during the campaign, 17 times total since 2011. So I think they understand that and they like the big get and, you know, been able to deliver the big get. So that's, you know, that's been really good. Uh, we did have an issue with uh, Joe Scarborough uh, for a little bit. He wouldn't let me talk, but that's all right. I smiled through it. You yeah, held your well, own. You held your own. Well, I appreciate it. So, but it's been interesting. Yeah, there have been a few Excedrin moments, but otherwise, um, <laughs> I think I think it's been fine. I mean, look, I, I think it's important for people to understand about this book. This is not the sainthood of Donald Trump. We've mm -hmm. talked about this. The, the book's called The Faith of Donald Trump. It could also be called The Faith Journey mm -hmm. of Donald Trump. And what we've seen in the last couple of years is a spiritual voyage that he's been on. And I don't think there's any question about that. Lots of stories in the book about that. Uh, and I think people are going to be kind of fascinated to find out the full story because we hear about Russia, 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 New York Times above the fold, 11 seconds in the soundbite. But what about if it's a 25 second soundbite? As I said to Chris Cuomo this morning, the rest of the soundbite's in this book. In other words, this is the fuller picture of Donald Trump. Well, if you don't know and you haven't had a chance to read the book, mm -hmm. David and Scott have tremendous access to the president mm -hmm. and vice president. So I'm, I'm wondering if you can tell people about mm -hmm. what it was like to sit down in the White House with President Donald Trump and what was his reaction when he found out the title of the book, oh, The Faith okay. of Donald Trump. Well, so this is a really good question because, great question, John, I was giving you a compliment. Thank you, yeah, I try. You bet. Uh, so we had um, 30 minutes in the Oval Office with him, which honestly, anytime you get in the Oval Office for a minute and a half and a cup of coffee is great, but we had 30, so we'll take it. We wanted three hours, but as you might imagine, they can only do so much. Sure. We had 30 minutes. Um, it's so funny. It was Okay, so it was myself uh, and uh, Donald Trump and Hope Hicks uh, in the Oval Office, the three of us. And uh, I'll never forget, Hope looks over at Donald Trump and says, so David's here, like she had to explain it again. David's here to write a book and it's called The Faith of Donald Trump. And I'll never forget Donald Trump's reaction. He looks over at Hope and goes, hmm, <laughs> like, that's not bad. You know, I just thought it was kind of like yeah. childlike in a, in a fun way. A novel it, idea. Very, mm -hmm. I, thought, I should have thought of that myself. Sure. I could have had a huge rate. Anyhow, so that was interesting. And then I think the, mo the most interesting part of that whole interview was the... Oh, there it is right there. Oh, well, yeah, that's our mm -hmm. first one. That was the uh, sit down, yeah. The sit down in the blue room. But the actual Oval Office interview I did for the book 
three to four minutes were taken up by Baron actually coming in. His, ch his son Baron came into the room with the tennis pro instructor from the Rose Garden. I kid you not, this happened. Uh, and, you know, he asked how Baron was. Is he good at tennis? He wanted to know the, asked the tennis pro instructor. Tennis pro instructor said, Baron's good uh, uh, when he's focused. Uh, and so I just thought that was kind of interesting. So anyhow, Baron in the Oval Office, and I'm like, okay, Baron, I love you, but... You're, you're interrupting uh, yeah, my time. Uh, right, yeah. I mean, I got 30 minutes, right, so now right, I have right. 27 minutes, and it's killing me, so... Yeah, Didn't he say, isn't part of the story, uh, Baron had asked for a, a Diet Coke, Coke or something? Oh, yeah, so... And yeah. the president had a funny quip. Oh, I'm glad you reminded me of that. Thank you, there's lack of sleep here. Uh, <laughs> yeah, so Baron walks into the Oval Office and says, you know, I'm thirsty, can I get a Coke? I mean, he said it nicely, respectfully, and so whatever, I, call, I say the butler, I don't know who it is, somebody brought him a Coke, and Donald Trump looks at me and goes, boy, this kid's got a life. You know, he comes to the Oval Office, orders a Diet Coke. Whoa, what a life he's got. So he kind of did it in his New York accent. It kind of made me laugh. What so, a life. What a what life. What a life, ordering a Diet Coke in the Oval Office. If, if I was can. not offered a drink. If I can, just one more quick question. So I know when you go on these talk shows, yeah. you come prepared with talking points and, and kind of know where you want to go. Uh, but I'm curious, when you, you've entered some of these different venues, mm -hmm. uh, has there been a topic or anything that you wanted to discuss that you haven't been able to share, whether it was Hannity or on MSNBC? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, it's interesting. Uh, my son and I, um, I have three children, but my son and I talked about this last night, actually, about really having a chance to witness uh, and, and to go on these shows and, and really talk about that Donald Trump is a sinner, and so are you, and so am I, and so is Jenna and Amber and all of us. And so then a chance to really share the gospel message in a very short, concise way and uh, it was really touching, actually. My son actually was the one that kind of was like, oh, yeah, I should have thought of that. But no, it was my son. Wow. Uh, so I guess I'd like to do a better job at doing that because I think in Donald Trump's story, we see a lot of grace. Mm -hmm. uh, grace by these evangelical leaders who could have easily shunned this guy. Well, I say easily. A lot of people have shunned him. But the evangelical leaders have decided not to shun him but embrace him. I know there's the skeptics will say they're embracing him for for access, but the truth of the matter is, these are these these folks have a track record of you know loving on folks and and really lifting people up, and and they fi figure why in the world would I uh, not want to you know witness and counsel to the president of the United States? So a lot of stories in the book. I have so many things I could say, but I know what we're running out of time. You're going to cut me off, aren't well, you? Well, we are all so happy for you. Thank Congratulations, you. and it really is. It's a fantastic book. I'm about halfway through right now. Okay, good. Loving it. It's so great. You're not going to put it down. No, I can't put it. It's a it's a page turner. Page you start turner. reading it. It's hard to put down. Did you say your favorite page was the acknowledgments? Because <laughs> you your that. name is in it. Yes. And so did you just skip to the if, end? If I'm not saying Flip to the end. I, I, and there's Jenna. I, I, I told I John got one too. I told Amber David, there's Amber and there's John. Yeah. I told David I was going to read it from cover to cover, which was initially, of course, the introduction, the forward, and then the acknowledgments. Right, so. right. Well, I, I will, I, let me just say one other thing. I, the liberals were very funny on Twitter when I, the faith of Donald Trump and then one person put up a blank page and said, look, I received an advanced copy. <laughs> oh, hilarious. Uh, but it turns out we're over 300 pages plus wow. in this book because mm -hmm. there's a lot to tell and a lot of spiritual voyage that he is on now. So I, I really think people should pick, listen to me, pick it up, uh, go to Amazon.com because you're going to learn some stuff about this president uh, that you probably do not know. Mm -hmm. I know you don't know. Mm -hmm. I didn't know. It's another store, too, Barnes & Noble, really anywhere you can buy books. Anywhere, mm -hmm. anywhere. Uh, so, yeah. All right. Thank, Thank you, you, David. Thanks, Thanks well, for having me. Amber, what are people saying online? <laughs> uh, we got a couple of comments. This one from Marjorie, who says she's ordered the book, can't wait to read it. She says, I'm not a big reader, but she's going to read that one. So, mm -hmm. uh, oh, no, actually, that was Sylvia Sanchez, who said she's not a big reader, but she wants to read that one. And Marjorie, who said... I have the book on order. So there you go. Fantastic. At least two copies for you. Hello. You <laughs> All right. That's good. So Thanks, we have Amber. sales up to two. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. I'll take it. You're on your way. We're trying for double On your way. All right. Well, what is it like to know the president looks to you for his news? When we come back, I sit down with Fox News' Ainsley Earhart to ask that very question. Stick around. I want it to be God. I want it to be Christ. Hey there. Make sure you check out my new uplifting Christian entertainment show, Studio 5.
Well, for over a decade, Fox & Friends has dominated morning show ratings. 2017 was the most watched year for the show, averaging nearly 1.7 million viewers across America every day. That's right, and it includes the country's commander-in-chief. That's right. Earlier this week, I went up to New York to sit down with Ainsley Earhart, one of the show's hosts, and asked her about the growing influence of America's number one morning show. Ainsley, thank you for sitting down with us for Faith Nation. You're welcome, Jenna. Thanks for having me. Uh, you know, President Trump, he loves Fox and Friends. What's it like knowing that the President of the United States is watching? I think it's such a privilege. I know he watches all the channels, but I think to, to know that he's interested in our show and he enjoys our show, I think that's a great honor. I mean, who wouldn't want the President of the United States? The greatest honor in our country who wouldn't want he or she to watch our show? I think it's I think it's wonderful. Does it influence at all, or, uh, or or change the way maybe you talk about things or things that you cover? No, it really does not. I will I'll know the news story and I will pick and choose what I want to talk about based on how I think it's going to affect our audience. Mm -hmm. I want to tell Democrats people, I want to inform people, so. mm -hmm. this is Democrats the story, this is why you need to know, this is why we think it's so important for us to tell you. This is how it's going to affect you and your family. And I grew up in the South. I grew up, you know, in a middle class family. I know that moms and dads work really hard and they go to work every day to put food on the table, to pay for great Christmas presents for their kids and give them the best Christmas they can have, to send them to college, to maybe buy them, you know, a a dilapidated car, which is what my dad worked so hard to pay for that first car. And it was, you know, it wasn't a Porsche or a BMW. We had a Buick Skyhawk and we all shared it. And we were so grateful for that car. And dad worked so hard for that. And I know that that's how families are. You know, when we walked out of a room, we had to turn the lights off. When we made a collect call, dad would tally it up and, and say, or make a, a long distance phone call, dad would bring me the bill and say, you owe me a dollar thirty-seven or whatever it was. And he was teaching us to the value of a dollar. And so I, I know that's how most families are, that most families in America are living paycheck to paycheck. So we just, we bring you the stories, we tell you why you need to care about it, how it's gonna, how we need to um, keep our own family safe, what, we, what you need to know. And so that's what's important to me. It's not because I know the president's watching and we need to have a certain narrative. And if, if I find something if I don't like a tweet that he tweets out, I'll say it on air. You know, he shouldn't have said that, but you know, I, I might like that he's doing this, this, and this. And the president, he has been bold on, on issues of faith. I'm wondering, do you feel like this boldness that he's portraying gives cover to a lot of Christians, to people of faith, to be more bold in, in how they live their lives and how they express their faith? Well, what I heard on the campaign trail a lot was the reason they wanted President Trump to win versus Hillary Clinton is because of the courts. Mm -hmm. Many people who were pro-life wanted wanted conservative judges in office and are in those positions. And I'm realizing as we, as we cover, as you know, we just finished covering or talking a lot about tax reform, um, Obamacare, we realized everything was tied up in Congress and how important it is to ev for everyone to go to the polls and vote the way they think is best because the judges are important, who you're gonna put in office is important because rules are decided, laws are decided based on who we all elect and put, and put in positions. And so the direction of this country is determined by who those judges are. Man, that was Ainsley Earhart with Fox & Friends. It was so much fun to sit down with her. Uh, we're gonna be rolling out more of that interview in the days to follow, so be sure to stay tuned in here and we'll, and we'll keep you posted on that. Up close and personal. Up very close and personal, <laughs> yeah. She job. could not have been uh, more kind, just yeah, such Great a nice job. person. And I was taking pictures for you. You were my social media guy. <laughs> Hello. Yep. I'll take a check later. Thank you very much. Uh -huh. Check's in the mail. I bet it is. I'm ahead of you. <laughs> Speaking of social media, uh, <laughs> we are still gonna be around after the show. We're gonna wrap things up today, but we're still around after the show. We're going to jump online. We're going to comment, send us your questions, and we will uh, do our best to get you some answers. But that's going to do it for this edition of Faith Nation. The show will uh, still be here on Facebook, so keep commenting with us. We're going to stick around and take some of your comments and yes. interact with you guys for a few minutes. All right. See you next week.